My name is Rick Chess. I direct the creative writing program here at UNCA, and I'm very happy to welcome you this evening for what I know is going to be an amazing reading. Um, when I came here in 1989, shortly after I got here, I went to hear a reading in the Humanities Lecture Hall, a reading by Keith Flynn. And it was the first time that I'd heard of him and that I got to hear him read. And uh, I vividly remember that reading for two reasons. Uh, the first is that the poems he read were mind-blowing. Uh, his associative mind leaping from image to image while still writing an incredibly coherent and deeply moving poem and musical poem uh, really engaged me through the whole reading. And then the other thing that took me totally by surprise was during his reading, he read a poem by Delmore Schwartz. Um, now, I don't know how many of you out there know of the poet named Delmore Schwartz. He was a very important mid-century American poet who died a tragic death, um, who was also the teacher, the poetry teacher of Lou Reed. Um, and he's an amazing poet that I think is being overlooked at the moment. And so between Keith's incredible poems that first time that I got to hear him and by his passion for poetry that other people were ignoring, especially the poetry of Delmore Schwartz, I was just totally out of my mind, uh, jumping for joy at having discovered this man and his work and his gorgeous voice. Um, many of you here already know Keith and love him and his work. Some of you are just discovering his work for the first time and I know you're going to become fans. Um, I hope you'll become fans quickly enough to race over to the Malaprops book table at the end of the reading and pick up a copy of one of Keith's books, which I know he'll be very happy to sign for you later today. Keith has an expansive imagination that can range from writing about deeply charged political and historical subjects to uh, folklore and uh, local regional landscapes and characters and he writes in a range of styles from the most traditional to the most experimental. He's the author of five books. This is the part where I'm going to now just read the bio. Um, he's the author of five books including four collections of poetry, The Talking Drum, The Book of Monsters, The Lost Sea, and The Golden Ratio as well as a terrific um, collection of essays entitled The Rhythm Method, Razzmatazz, and Memory, How to Make Your Poetry Sing. From 1987 to 98, he was lyricist and lead singer for the nationally acclaimed rock band The Crystal Zoo. His poetry has been published all over the world in many of the prominent journals in the U.S., as well as in important journals elsewhere. He's won numerous awards, and he's also the founder and publisher of the Asheville Poetry Review, which is really one of the premier poetry uh, journals in the United States. States. I do want to say one other thing. A few years ago, a very dear close friend of Keith's decided to take a poetry class that I was teaching, an introduction to poetry class, and I think I was never more intimidated uh, that s than I was that semester having you, Denise, in that room wondering what is she going to go back and tell Keith that I'm talking about today and how I'm ruining poetry for her and for everyone else. I hope that's not what happened. Um, Keith, we're very honored and very pleased to have you here. Um, as a former student of UNCA and one of the founders of the Blue Banner, we gladly welcome you back. Please join me in welcoming Keith Flynn. I think that's the best introduction I ever had, Rick. You are the sweetest thing on two legs. I, uh, I think that's going to stay. Everybody okay? That's better there, right? Um, it's interesting you, you talked about Delmar Schwartz because I was, um, when we were sitting in your office talking earlier, I looked on the shelf and I saw a book of Delmar Schwartz's poetry. And I thought to myself, man, nobody knows who Schwartz is. Nobody talks about him. And that was... Um, and I meant to say something to you when we were sitting in the office. One of the things that Delmar Schwartz said is the riches 
of the poet are equal to his poetry. And um, hopefully you guys will find a way tonight to, uh, to find a little something to take away with us. If it's a few coins or if it's a little something more rich, that's cool too. Um, I want to start out tonight with a poem. Um, it's called Left Behind. This is one of the few poems that I've ever written that happened exactly like I'm putting it down here. Um, and um, that's strange enough to begin with because most of the time, you know, poets are dramatic liars. And uh, they have to be because we have to take things of the world and make them into something else. Now, the truth is properly shaded in that exercise. But hopefully, at the other end of it, there's some facsimile of threads that are unraveling toward the truth and a portal that we can all enter. Um, this poem is called Left Behind because it was taken from, do you guys know the Timothy LaHaye uh, novels that are written about the uh, rapture, essentially? Um, I guess they talk about the book of Revelation. And um, it's interesting because many folks who talk about uh, um, the rapture or folks who have a, say, conservative or evangelical bent um, typically talk about the rapture and the Bible as being, of course, infallible. That whatever the Bible says goes, and there's one interpretation and only one interpretation. Now, having said that, it's interesting that Timothy LaHaye and these folks have gotten about 15 books out of the book of Revelation. And, uh, and they're, they're wildly violent. Um, it's almost like uh, son of Rambo, cousin of Rambo, Rambo 10. Um, and they're bloody as it gets. Um, I've thought about the rapture. Having grown up as a uh, Southern Baptist kid, um, I've thought about the rapture quite a bit. And wondered, you know, because that's pretty strange to think about being flying along in a plane and suddenly some folks disappear and are not to be found anymore. Particularly the pilot might upset your day. And um, I've always uh, thought that that was a pretty interesting way to uh, call all of the chosen back to the Father. Uh, hopefully you'll get the joke inherent in this. It's called Left Behind. This jejune Jesuit and myself, pure joist, a beam balanced beneath our bottle of scotch, warm in my throat, as we share conversation in a limousine from LaGuardia Airport to the snowy west side of New York. God is barely alive, he confesses, and time is short, but scotch is better than port. I don't know, I answer. I'm a whiskey man myself, but if forced to simile, I would state unequivocally that God is a tractor and the rapture a myth in the way of his corn. Yes, he says, Jesus was to mortal woman born, homeless and naked as a thief, stealing what little warmth the animals provided. I'm divided, I admit, staring behind the joint that I've lit, through the smoke to the harbor and its horn, ramming Manhattan with snow. Those that read the Bible know, my friend continues, that the signposts point toward a glorious end. Earthquakes and hurricanes, pestilence, the earth, the shrike of a house waiting to explode. Ah, but not before he calls the faithful home, right? I ask. Not until, the minister gloats, not until the earthly vessels float to meet the king on high. I'm nigh to floating as well, with 20 more minutes to ride, trapped in a limo with a minister from Memphis and feeling left behind. The poor are easy targets, I decide, for they will never ride in chariots or drink cognac from a golden chalice. So to pray for the mighty to fall is, all in all, their only defense. I sense in my companion a rumbling, a personal recollection from one of the many prominent people he has known, but instead he moans, lightheaded from my secondhand smoke, 
and says simply, boy, the devil is no joke. What's the devil to do at the century's end except to sing the scarecrow blues and trawl the alley for friends? I'll pray for your soul, the preacher replied, but this is my building and I must say goodbye. And he gave my hand a long, warm shake and then waiting for the silence to break, I knocked on the window and the driver stopped. The Jesuit rocked, then stumbled, leaving tracks in the snow. And I wondered how long the wind would blow. And I realized at the same time that I'd been stiffed and the fare from the airport was mine alone. I laughed, toked, pondered my Christmas gift, serenaded by a Jesuit who needed a lift, a half bottle of scotch and a warning for a tip. The black car ripped a trail through the lights. God is a tractor plowing long into the night. I am... Um, Recently, some of you may uh, have uh, been paying attention at the last election and uh, noticed that we uh, voted for a guy and elected a president who actually um, doesn't have any war experience, um, was not a soldier, um, doesn't come from that background in the least. And um, this poem was actually written at the time of Donald, um, was written for Donald Rumsfeld, I guess. I noticed as he was getting ready to exit, uh, a lot of times there was this, I saw this whole montage of uh, uh, appearances that he'd made in national media. And every time I saw him, he had, that was prominently displayed under his arm, was this book by a great Chinese philosopher and general known as Sun Tzu. And the book is known as The uh, Art of War. It's now become de rigueur for lots of CEOs and, and management types to give that book to their uh, middle managers, try to whip them into shape and use the philosophies of war to handle their employees. And um, I started thinking about um, that. I started thinking about Donald Rumsfeld, and I was thinking, you know, I need to write a poem, and I entitled it The Secret War of Art. Um, and... Um, I want to uh, I want to preface these remarks with a little bit of a gospel song, if that's okay, and then I'll move on into the poem. You got to go down to the lonesome valley. And you, you got to go down there by yourself. You got to go down. To the lonesome valley, and you, you got to go down there by yourself. for it when it comes. My first gig, 
I sat on the front pew at the funeral of a man I barely knew. The details are vague as the sun. His face, what can I say? Mother paid me 25 bucks to sing Amazing Grace. The secret war of art, more flames. Falling in love with cool mountain music, America's periodic flirtation with bluegrass has stirred Ralph Stanley from his death march. And he sang to us what lay ahead in broken tones, his voice full of rock clefts and sheer cliff shimmy holes, the dead lift spared over for another year. Because, my friends, the aesthetics of improvisation cannot be practiced before it's over. In improvisation, the performance is right now. There is no blueprint or mirror, no body clock to measure the centrifugal force and uncertain ratios of art. It cannot be eaten or taxed, this mad culpable need to see an audience sweat. Like Miles Davis struggling to regain his voice as his lips atrophied, or Chet Baker with his teeth beaten out, or Beethoven molding notes as the wind tunnel closed around his deafening mind. Finding your own story is like trying to change a tire underwater. It's a stub toe sort of cry, an emergency. Like being forced at gunpoint to compose the entire melody of your life. And we need to put everything in singing or making love. Like Art Tatum played piano, hard, fast, and unusual, with all virtuosity pushed into the reckless transitions from bridge to chorus, scorched earth harmonies and family secrets. Art, flattening every artificial paradise cannot help itself, and poetry holds on to the air and it whispers remedies in the ears of poets with death perched on the dining table and the walls contending that you are utterly alone. But the fire, suspended in its iron box, pretends otherwise, hissing signs and signifiers, the secret war of art, contradicting the dead steel case and the grave's rectangle the sons bearing the weight of their mystic cargo. When you are dead, on the rim, all your black heirs will lurk and say, how stately you look, with perfect composure, and your chin is placed just so, Invisible symphonies all sorted out and dignified as a camel, ready to face whatever comes next. So the motionless artist, eager to know, lies and waits. Some men sing as they leave this earth, ringing their hosannas. But others, blown inward by listening, slip into the sky's quiet knot, claiming never to have heard a thing. We were talking earlier. Um, with some of the kids from Rick's class. I appreciate you guys coming out tonight. It's very sweet of you. I assume you're all getting extra credit. Um, and um, I wanted to do two things here. Um, one, one, of you, one of the questions I was asked was talking about when did you get your first poem published? Uh, I actually was here, a student here 22 years ago when I published 
my uh, some of my first poems, um, and um, I decided while we, while we were talking about that that maybe I should uh, read you one of those poems because I asked the question. I said, "How many folks in here are poets?" And nobody raised their hand. And I thought, wait a minute now. I'm taking poetry classes, there's no poets in here. And I realized nobody was going to claim to be a poet <laughs> in the room until they felt like they maybe had some stuff published or something like that. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. But what I want to do is I want to read you one of the first poems that I ever had published. And I also want to read you one of the first poems that a poet who lives close to here, or lived close to here for many years, Carl Sandburg, ever published. And um, uh, I think they sort of dovetail one into the other, so that's how I'm going to read them. The first one is, uh, in some ways, uh, and if you ever get a chance to go out and see the Carl Sandburg place in Connemara, it's really beautiful, and you'll love the goats. And um, the, uh, and the setting is fantastic. Uh, Poor Carl Sandburg, though he was very successful, was always in this country sort of our uh, B-League Robert Frost. But he was a much better poet than that, and he deserves better. Um, this is a poem of his that I think really sort of moves between these two poems pretty well. It's called, and this is one of the first poems he ever published. It's called Death Snips Proud Men. Death is stronger than all the governments because the governments are men, and men die, and then death laughs. Now you see them, now you don't. Death is stronger than all proud men, and so death snips proud men on the nose, throws a pair of dice, and says, read them and weep, daddy. Death sends a radiogram every day. When I want you, I'll drop in. And then one day he comes with a master key. He lets himself in. And he says, we'll go now. Death is a nurse mother with big arms. This won't hurt you at all, child. It's your time now. You just need a long, long sleep. And honey, what have you ever had anyway that was better than sleep? This is a poem that I wrote about a woman I was obsessed with on the quad. <laughs> paced the quad up many, many evenings to catch a glimpse of her going to chemistry class. I wore my own path across the quad, stalking her. This poem is called Dream Trail. And this mic sounds so good, I think I'm going to sing a little bit more. Is that all right? Is that cool? I'm seeing a little piece of something to get us into the mood. Because I never could get her in the mood. It's called Dream Trail. And I think you'll recognize the song, perhaps. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Only darkness every day. Yeah. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. In this house, it ain't no home. Anytime she goes away. Yeah, yeah. Don't know where it is. She's gone. Don't know if she's gonna stay. 
Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. And this house, it ain't no home. Anytime she goes away. Oh, On the map of your body, I marked a road, a tender path through marshes and magnolias that droop with sleep and brush across my windshield as I pass, waving. As I am told the Japanese wave until a guest is a dot on the sun not turning away in a rush, but waving at the memory a handshake made, the wind through the fingers, sharing. If I could turn a stone in you without the dark acids bubbling up around my feet and lay my cheek against the dead grass, which is jaundiced now, but waiting, waiting for the spark of a star to turn in your thighs, for the green lights to glow again in the fields of your eyes, because at every quiet fork, you divide your prayers into want and need and forge ahead down a path untangling into night, saying, grant me a respite from what the butchers claim to be right. Close my eyes to the messages laid out in the symmetry of bones. We come together like blind roots out of fear. And in that pocket, your teeth tick like castanets. The moon limps behind a cloud and rests there, a humming stone. For in the night of your answer, the gonging of all our blood will be told. Remember, on the map of your body, I marked a road. Oh, to be 19 again. It was funny. Uh, somebody, uh, I, one of the students asked me, he said, um, how has your work changed since you first started writing poems when you were 17? And um, in ways that I can only tell you, come back and see me when you're 47. <laughs> boy, oh, boy. Um. I want to do a poem now by another poet. How many of you know who Philip Levine is? Uh, one of his most famous poems is uh, uh, from the 60s. And it talks about the gradual accumulation of problems. And um, it seemed uh, when, I've, you know, when we had this nuclear weapon that sort of went off in the middle of our economy about 13 or 14 weeks ago, which nobody could explain really, Nobody saw it coming, and it reminded me of this poem so much that this poem felt like a prophecy to me somehow. And I woke up today, and I've been thinking about it all day, and Rick was kind enough to go get me a copy of it. So I want to do this poem for you. I haven't read this poem in public probably in 10 years or so, but uh, I want to do it for you tonight. It's called They Feed, They Lie. Out of burlap sacks, out of bearing butter, out of black bean and wet slate bed, out of the acids of rage, the candor of tar, out of creosote, gasoline, drive shafts, wooden dollies, they lie and grow. Out of the gray hills of industrial barns, out of rain, out of bus rides, West Virginia to kiss my ass. Out of buried aunties, mothers hardening like pounded stumps. 
out of stumps, out of the bones need to sharpen and the muscles to stretch, they lie and grow. Earth is eating trees, fence posts, gutted cars. Earth is calling in her little ones. Come home, come home from pig balls, from the ferocity of pig driven to holiness, from the furred ear and the full jowl come the repose of the hung belly, from the purpose they lie and grow, from the sweet glues of the trotters come the sweet kinks of the fist, from the full flower of the hams and the thorax of the caves, from bow down come rise up, come they lion from the needs of shovels, the grained arm that pulls the hands and they lie and grow. From my five arms and all my hands, from all my white sins forgiven, they feed. From my car passing under the stars, they lion. From my children inherit, from the oak turned to a wall, they lion. From the sack and from their belly opened, and all that was hidden burning on the all-stained earth, they feed, they lion, and he comes. There is, um, how's everybody doing? I, um, I thought it was interesting that we needed to get $700 billion to bail out the guys that created a $10 trillion problem. And I didn't hear a single politician say anything about taking $700 billion and helping anybody that was having a home foreclosed or who was having trouble meeting their bills. Now, the guys at Goldman Sachs and AIG and Lehman Brothers, they, I'll bet you not a single one of them has a foreclosure on any of their houses or cars at all. That's just an inkling on my part. But I believe that it's so. Somehow, we have gotten our value system upside down. When I saw them talking about over and over, you know, people were upside down on their mortgages. Their houses are now worth less than what they owe on them. And people in Florida and California and Colorado and Texas were just getting in their cars and driving off leaving them sitting there, right? Never seen such a thing in my life. I want to do a uh, poem for you. I hope you'll pardon the academic title. This is called The Fatigue of Postmodern Irony. Um, I actually got the idea watching when I was watching Chris Rock. Anybody know Chris Rock? And I was thinking about, you know, the, Things are only funny when they have an element of truth in them. If something's not true, it doesn't make us laugh, right? And I was thinking about most contemporary comedians. They don't really tell jokes anymore. They just create the most unbelievable or profane scenarios that they can think of. And they make us laugh like crazy because they're saying things to us in a public forum that we wouldn't say to our loved ones in the privacy of our boudoir. Right? But they're crazy funny because why? It's true. So I started thinking about that and I started, I wanted to create a poem that spoke plainly and um, in some ways said exactly what I was feeling at the time. So I came up with a form. The form is called a two ply. Can everybody see that? Can you see that at all? See the two plies they move down the page there? Uh, each of those sections has, there's never more than uh, six beats to a line, and thankfully never less than one. And they sit side by side on the page because each of the little columns could be a poem in itself, but they're companions. And 
they could exist alone or they can exist together and hopefully the one speaks to the other on the other side of the page and if indeed it gets cold uh, it has somebody to warm its toes against um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to each of these little sections has its own title so I'm just going to do the the title and then move through the poems they're very small there's usually each poem only has three sentences in it uh, each ply as it were and um, the, um, I was also thinking about, right after I wrote this, I was also, you know, it's, there's a sort of a, a thing going on right now about our national anthem. There's people who don't necessarily like our national anthem. Um, and there was a, somebody recently who refused to sing the national anthem and, and uh, it caused a great uh, uh, squall. It was some uh, professional basketball player as a guy with a lot of troubles. And um, so I thought to myself, you know, really and truly, our national anthem is, you know, does somewhat suck. Um, it's, a, it's a very so complex, hard to sing melody. Um, there are tons and tons, you guys are filming this tonight, but there are lots of things on film of people singing the national anthem and stinking up the joint. Anybody remember Roseanne Barr's beautiful rendition from a few years ago? Um, and there are worse ones than that. But and I started thinking about it. In other words, it's not completely appropriate either because all the lyrics are about death and destruction and war. Is that what we are about? Is that what this country is about? It was written in the, during the War of 1812, which is a bad sixth grade joke to start with. And... I don't think it's appropriate for our time now. So I'm going to pause it. And there are other better ones. I mean, you know, This Land is Your Land is a really beautiful song. And I would say that that could replace the Star Spangled Banner in a heartbeat. But um, what I'd like to do is sing you a little something uh, with all due respect to the late, great Ray Charles that I think is more appropriate. And I'm going to sing that, and then I'll get us into the poem. The poem is called, Lest We Forget, after my lengthy introduction, The Fatigue of Postmodern Irony. And the song, I think you'll recognize. Oh, beautiful, full spacious sky. For amber waves of grain For purple mountains majesty Above the fruited plain America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea the Puritan dilemma Once we built 100,000 bomb shelters in America trying to make sense of the atom's terrible contagions. We never used a one. Oscar Wilde said he knew perfectly well why America was so violent. It's because our wallpaper was so damn ugly.
But what is history but a fable agreed upon? The past is smoke, deep shadowed plazas teeming with hungry ghosts. The Puritans with their coiled dilemmas could not know that the evil was already here when they landed, waiting for their boats. Forty. Forty black churches have burned in the South in just four years. Thirty years after Dr. King was gunned down, his son shakes hands with the killer and forgives. Forty years after Bobby Kennedy was slain in L.A., we've elected a black president. And still, two out of three inner city black men in America are in prison or on parole. 40% of the water in North America is unfit for swimming, fishing, or drinking. I saw a pink flamingo plunge like a withered violin into the sea. Olive trees quivered in their arboretums. Waco, Ruby Ridge, Oklahoma, Beirut, New York, Islamabad. What you do in the karma kitchen is your own business. You see, this poem is more harmless than dioxin and will probably spend less time in your heart. In the mission room, 20 stories above the high country of the swans, my mother paces, clutches her face, and asks why I leave out all the happy parts. But it's not enough to dream the notes. You have to go deep inside your body but we are a bulky people. We're hard to move. Takes a death to move a family or a building in flames being rammed by a tank or two towers being exploded by two jets spooling over and over and over on the lurid evening news. Completely Christian karate. The local minister full of brimstone preaches separation, shaving the pitch in the scope of his sermon, having caught a terminal case of the millennium bug using the Tom Tom time-tested, completely Christian tactics, hoping to karate chop the teenagers towards salvation. Any man may call spirits from the dark, but what will he say when they come? And what will he do when they stop? Tradition is the illusion of permanence. It is Christmas and snowing. Rudolph, the red-nosed survivalist, can no longer elude the FBI. The hoop dance. Celebrating the circle of life beneath the pregnant golden moon, jumping in and out of sacred hoops, the Indians knew the earth was round long before Columbus stumbled into them. 
We watch the cars pass, savage cabinets of time. Like deer in the darkness, we stare out, blinking our little diamond eyes. If I could speak to you as clearly, my friends, as the moon speaks to the hill, I would lay my cheek against your cheek and say to you, this is all we are. Every blue breath viewed from afar takes something from this world. Trying to find a voice. Trying to find what it is to help you make poetry. What is it that comes through you to help you make poetry? Poetry is what the world wants when its heart is broken. The most beautiful things we can think of, pure poetry, poetry in motion. The need got to be so deep that words can't answer simple questions. All night long notes stumble off the tongue and color the air indigo so deep fragments of gut and flesh cling to the song. You got to get into it, man. So deep that salt crystallizes on eyelashes and the need got to be so deep that you can vomit up ghosts and not feel broken till you are no more than a half ounce of gold in painful brightness, and you got to get into it, man. you got to blow that saxophone so deep that all the sex and dope in this world can't erase your need to howl against the sky. The need got to be so deep you can't just wiggle your hips and rise up out of it because there's chaos in the cosmos and modern man in the pepper pot, and you got to get hooked into every hungry groove so deep that the bomb locked in rust opens like a fist and it turns into it and it is deep man rhythm is pre-memory and the need got to be basic it's an animal need to see and know the terror of the blues we are made of honey because if you want to dance this boogie you better be ready baby to let the devil use your head for a drum I didn't write that. That's by a poet named Yusef Kumanyaka. How many of you know who Kumanyaka is? Good. Kumanyaka has a collect, uh, selected poems called Neon Vernacular. And um, that's one of the poems from that book. You should definitely get a chance to check him out. I spent most of my life reading poetry and thinking about poetry. Um, and I'm usually pretty hard on cats when I think that the poetry is not really happening. Um, in 2001, um, I did a tour for a book of mine called The Lost Sea. I did 176 shows that year. And Kumanyaka and I seemed to be booked in all the same places. For about three months, every time we turned around, he had been either been there the day before or it was coming two or three days after me, everywhere we went. I swear to God, it was like being a rock band and opening for Metallica or being on the same tour, except Metallica got to play the big room, right? And I'd go in and they'd go, where's the crowd tonight? And they go, sorry, man, Kumanyaka was just here, <laughs> right? Um, but the beautiful thing about that tour was I got to listen to Kumanyaka read several times, and he's a fantastic poet. The problem was I also got to hear a lot of other poets read who were very famous that year who spent a lot of time stinking it up. How many, how many of you, this is the first poetry reading you've ever been to? Ah. 
Well, I'm very happy to have gotten y'all's cherry. <clears throat> this is, um, poetry readings aren't all like this. There's some a lot better, trust me. And there's some a lot worse. And I went through a period where I couldn't believe it, but for some reason, all these poets who were heroes of mine when I was a kid, you come and you read their poems, then you come see them read, and you think to yourself, oh, man, I'm getting the opportunity to see one of my heroes. Man, this poem has changed my life. And then you come out, you can show up at the reading, and the guy sucks. Right? Acts like he could care less that he was there. Acts like he couldn't care whether you paid to see him, didn't pay to see him, never came again. And I say men because it does seem to be a habit of white men who get very famous and disengage themselves from the beautiful rhythms of their poetry. They read the poem as if they never wrote it. So after that tour, I began to assemble bad poets and put them on my bad poet tree and above my desk I had a tree and every time somebody would suck I'd stick his name on it <laughs> right and then that tree started getting full finally I began to combat this the only way I knew how by starting a poem this is called listening as another famous man badly reads his poems In the intervals between laborious searches for page numbers and breathless meditation, a man audibly chewing ice mutters in his bourbon, and two vigilant crickets are engaged in musical foreplay downstage when suddenly the poem begins. The natty monotone delivered like a phone conversation to a mother-in-law about fertilizing her lawn. And before the nodding audience knows what hit them, the piece abruptly ends and two nervous claps clop unevenly from a candlelit corner. Then the bloated quiet and rustling pages begin anew. One night, the poet wears Aladdin's shoes and uses self-deprecating jokes to lower expectations. Another night, the poet wears a soiled hair shirt and uses uncombed, freshly wakened beard bits to keep the local blue-voiced groupie mavens at bay. Say that ten times fast. The glamour of the cold page makes administrators woozy with freshly cut checks, and stunned undergraduates change their majors to business law, knowing now that dad was right all along. And the rhythm is lost or abandoned, and the canned comments so scripted that they garner more interest than the text, which becomes illegible in the mouth of its master. A bowhead whale tumbling behind his massive girth, shoveling compliments in his maw like plankton. Pulitzer riding on his snout like a hood ornament. And all six-winged hope drowned in his throat. And no matter how mundane the personal experience, the circumstance of each creation is so sacred. And he pours his charm into our cups which rattle on the bars inside ourselves, trapped as we are, fawning at the altar of fame, awkward and gawking like penguins baptized by a nearsighted priest. That poem's never made me many friends. I'm going to do one more, if that's okay. You guys doing okay? Right on, bro. I'm going to do one more poem, and then I'm going to open it up for some questions, if you guys like. Um, and um, 
Mount Props has provided us with a book table over here, which is very sweet of them. Um, as far as I know, there's no limit to the amount of books that you may purchase. And um, I'll, be, um, I'll be happy to sign a few. And if you have questions, you know, I notice that in a public forum sometimes people want to ask you questions and they just can't get up the guts to do it in front of everybody else. So if you buy a book or you just want to come over and whisper the question in my ear after everybody else is gone, we'll work that out too. Um, I wanted to do, I wanted to end the reading tonight with a poem that I wrote when I was a young man. I'm very happy to be here among the students. Rick, I want to thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate uh, the folks from North Carolina Educational Television coming here and filming this tonight. Uh, the sound sounds great, and I hope it looks great. And um, this poem is called Apostrophes. The head, it's a, uh, the head note is from a William Carlos Williams poem. Um, it's to Elsie from 1923. It says, the pure products of America go crazy. One of these days, and it won't be long, you look for me, Lord, and I'll be gone. I should have quit you, baby, a long time ago now. I should have quit you, baby. time ago my friend Harry is a Brooklyn attorney who just fell out of love we sit at his fourth floor apartment looking out the window while I listen to him lose his religion denounce his woman and his life. The Camerary Brothers Bakery mixes its smell with the Henry Street Fish Market. In the harbor, the lights from the Statue of Liberty flicker off and on at Europe like red rhinestones. Lyle Lovett is singing, Get back, chip kicker, redneck woman while disenfranchised Pontiacs crawl from alley to alley, looking for a warm place to hide. She ain't no lady, Lyle sings. She's my wife. We have to stay connected, Harry says. And I agree. We have to stay connected to a will person, a focus, a feeling. When all about us disengages, when the streetlights fail and blink out, steaming in protest, we have to stay, stay connected. I'm 34, she said. Sunday evening in a Tupelo blues bar. All the patrons chattering about the Gulf War on cable. Like watching the latest episode of Dynasty. Women must say this to you all the time, she said. You one handsome man. I got two small children and I don't get out much. And big boy, you are driving me crazy. A guy walks by in a black T-shirt, numb skull emblazoned on his chest. He couldn't slow down fast enough. 
There ain't no sunshine, she said. And I can't live like this forever. I could do almost, well, I could do any damn thing I want to do, but I come down here and a good woman drawed my husband away. I knowed her. She was come down here and watch him play. He played hard, man. He blowed it so hard it sounded like a freight train a coming. But you know, honor the dead, she said, waving her hand. Might as well honor the dead and let them rest. All you musicians is just shit anyway. Vain and powerful. All I seem to get. You know, Elvis lives near here, she said. He does. Close to the house his daddy built for 180 bucks. He borrowed it from somebody or another here in Tupelo. Because we all know Elvis around here. We see him come. We see him go. And he wouldn't just leave us hanging. We made it Elvis. You know, simple folks. And he wouldn't do nothing to hurt that. Around midnight, somewhere in the south, Thelonious Monk is playing piano, trinkle, tinkle. Some idiot comes out of the crowd playing banjo, but he's in tune. He's on the one, so Monk stays calm, keeps his head down, sweaty concentration dripping on his hands. Bill Monroe comes walking out of the ladies' room, zipping his fly. She blowed me so hard, he said. I went straight to the top of the country charts, boys, and I almost crossed over into pop. The wolf is coughing in a dark corner. Whoa, I asked a girl for water. And whoa, she gave me gasoline. And whoa, I asked a girl for water. And whoa. She gave me gasoline. Now that's a tablest woman. I damn near ever see. His kidneys are dried out like two old plums. He hacks an evil sound into the mic. Blah. Roars, eyes bulging. The lights linger, roll off. Little white girl in the front row looks up and goes, Honey, he's a little bit much, isn't he? He's a little primal for us, don't you think? She paints the biography of a naked ape and shakes another acrobat from his wire because agony is what we pay to see. Martyrs of the imagination. Poor monk floated in and out of sanitariums until the end when he could no longer recognize his son. He stopped playing opened the lid on his piano stool and stepped in, dropping out of sight. These shadows 
that squirm about my heart's garden are my brothers. And they cling like parasites to the furry underbelly of America. The mongrel that kills what it cannot unravel or forgets what it cannot trap in the ferocious coliseums where enormity dwindles to a single signal, a gunshot, a laughing light that winks on when it is happy and winks off when it is not. All right, you guys. If you got any questions that you'd like to ask or comments from the peanut gallery, now'd be the time. Yes. Go ahead. Um, what was the best poetry reading you've ever been to? <laughs> Say that again? What was the best poetry reading you've ever been to? Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, one of the best poetry readings I ever attended was by Robert Haas, a white guy <laughs> who read a very long poem that I would never have believed that he could pull off in an auditorium full of people um, but it was really, really moving, really beautiful and heartfelt, and um, I was very pleased to have been there. Um, another one of the best readings, um, I read with um, Rita Dove at the University of Syracuse, and uh, I thought she was fantastic as well. Um, I've been to a lot of good poetry readings. Um, poetry readings don't have to be bad. Um, and. Uh, but those are two that, that come right off the top. Uh, Kumanyaka is a fantastic poet. Uh, I've been, I read with Patricia Smith one night on Block Island. And um, we, uh, she read first and then I followed her and the crowd stayed and clapped and screamed so long that we've got up together and read for another hour. And then everybody left. Um, I guess we nobody had anything else to do. We were 100 miles off the coast <laughs> in, on an island, so nobody could get anywhere. So we, we sort of had them hostage that night. <laughs> but those are some of the ones that come to mind. Um, good poetry readings always have a mixture of uh, sort of humor and pathos and uh, are delivered with heartfelt goodness. You know what I mean? And. Uh, let the devil let the devil use your head for a drum. I just I once heard John Chardy uh, who said, um, "I'm so archaic, I even rhyme sometimes." Um, can Can you say something about rhyming poems? Well, poetry has to live in the air. I said this earlier. The page is a cold bed, and be that you have to use all of the sonic elements of the language that are at your disposal. Rhyme just happens to be one of the best ones for poets. Um, I've used a lot of rhymes tonight, uh, but I've also used slant rhymes and trick rhymes and half rhymes and end rhymes and interior rhymes. Um, and all of, all of those things speak. You're trying to make a poem move. A poem's got to be full of motion. And I've written before that it's a long piece of hungry momentum that rushes headlong down a page. And it has to admit no impediment, whether they're psychological or whether they're musical. There can be nothing to stop that poem's flow. Rhyme is one of the things that help move you down the page. And because a poem has to get into your body and stay there, 
because poem is made up of sonic architectures and rhythms that wants to live somewhere. A poem is a living organism. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, watch two stanzas, take three stanzas, and you take the middle stanza away and watch the first stanza move toward the third stanza as if the th second stanza never existed. And it looks like a piece of ectoplasm moving toward the piece of its tail that got cut away. A poem is a living organism, and it's built out of rhythm. Rhyme is just one way to make, you make the poem move and to keep that flow flowing down the page and directly into your body. Uh, hi, uh, you mentioned being raised uh, in the Southern Baptist tradition. Do you think the voice of the preacher, specifically uh, the voice of the Baptist preacher, do you think that has an influence on your poetry? And if so, could you talk about that? That's a, good, that's a really good question, too. First of all, what do you think? Well, it's true. Um, when I was when I was I was baptized when I was eight years old. I grew up in Madison County, which is about thirty miles from here, forty miles from here. I grew up on a dead end dirt road in a trailer, all right. And the only real center of activity socially when I was a kid was the church. And for a lot of rural uh, people, the church is the hub or the fulcrum or the center of all the activities taking place in the community. And so, you know, you go there to find friends to play ball. You go there to uh, go to Sunday school and to learn your Bible lessons. And I was baptized when I was eight years old. And um, everybody thought when I was a kid going to church there that I would grow up to be the minister in the church. Everybody just assumed that that was going to take place because I'd already started singing. Um, I started singing when I was five years old in a choir. And... Um, the reason I got to be the soloist was because I was so damn loud that they couldn't figure out where to put me, so they had to give me something to do to shut me up the rest of the time. It would be like the choir would come in, they would all start to sing, and I, would be, I was louder than everybody else. And they would go like, oh, man, little Flynn, go stand over there, man. And everybody would start singing, you can still hear me. They'd go, little Flynn, go stand over there. And you can still hear me. So finally what they decided to do was give me a line to sing, and so the rest of the time, they go, Little Flynn, you don't sing nothing. But when it comes to this time, you sing your line as loud as you can. And then you don't sing nothing else. And I thought that was cool, right? <laughs> I like that. So I just wait my turn until it's time for me to bust out my big line, you know. So I thought I was a star, <laughs> right? Um, so that was how I started singing. And slowly but surely, you know, that I, I, my singing voice in for me, evolved into my writing voice. And there's no way, there's great poetry in the Bible. There's no way to become intimate or familiar with the Bible, uh, particularly the book of Ecclesiastes or the book of Proverbs, um, and uh, not, you know, be influenced somehow by that. And, you know, it's, I, I think it's not, it's not, um, probably unusual or just happenstance that when I was in college and I read William Blake for the first time and Blake sort of opened this spring in me and all the water came out and made me want to be a poet but Blake was using Old Testament lines the lines are this long you know and those old rhythms were rhythms that I'd heard before as a child when we were reading the Old Testament and then Whitman did the same thing Whitman uses a long Old Testament line and that's where he got it and Allen Ginsberg, when he wrote How, that's the same line. That's a Whitman line. That's a Blake line. That's an Old Testament line. That's where it comes from. And um, uh, Jory Graham now, who writes, she writes very long lines. She doesn't have the same sonic qualities or passion of those other folks, but she's probably smarter and packs more information in her lines. But I think uh, there's no way, I think, you, that you can grow up in that environment and escape that. I, I think there's no way. And... There's, you know, it's, it's part of 
part of being a speaker means that you figure out this call and response, and there's a dynamic high to low. You know, one of the reasons I started singing and poetry readings, I, I really did it at first when I started singing. I wouldn't do, I wouldn't sing during a reading because I thought the two voices needed to be separated. You know, keep them apart. And then one time during a read, during a, a concert, the band, the guy broke a string, put a string on, broke another string. Then the drummer broke his uh, snare. I was like, Jesus, man, can we get something working here tonight? So I went to the front of the stage and just started quoting poetry, right? And the crowd ate it up. I was like, ding, <laughs> right? I thought, oh, I'm on to something. So then I started putting poems in some of my, in some of the band's performances and vice versa. I started singing a cappella for the poetry and um, seems to create that dynamic high and low that keeps an audience interesting interested and hopefully make the reading interesting anyway. So it's a good question. Um, I'm just wondering whether you, when you write a poem, do you get your inspiration from the music or do you incorporate the music after you write? Is it all together just something about that? Because I think it works so well and I'm just wondering how you pull that off. Like, um, Typically, when I start writing, I don't know if something's going to be a song or a poem, but there's a real difference. Um, somebody asked me what's the difference between a song and a poem when we were earlier in there. Were you in there when we were having pizza? That's why you asked that question, because the answer I gave in there lasted about 20 minutes, and everybody's going, you know. So I won't, I won't go on that long about it. Um, but there's a, there's a big difference there's a big difference between a song and a poem. Um, a song lyric has to be accompanied by a chord progression. It also has metric regularity because there's a drummer. Um, and, you know, no matter how drunk or stupid drummers are, they run the band. They run the band. I hate to admit it. I, trust me. Um, but, you know, you're the, I'm, I was always the front man, I thought, you know, I'm large and in charge, and everybody's paying attention to me. Yeah, buddy. Right up to the minute that the drummer decides to stop playing. <laughs> um, the rhythm is everything. And so, and you know, every single, you know, you hear the count, two, three, four, and everybody's in lockstep. So that metric regularity uh, is different than a poem. Now, a poem you know, tonight, these poems, I try my best to put as much music as possible into the poems. But, you know, it, you use all the effects that I talked about earlier to try to create the sonic architecture to string the poem on. But, you know, a song has got to have its own thing. And each disparate element has to come into... It's, a song is a collaboration, whereas a poem is a collaboration of elements created by a single creator. You know what I mean? And a song is a single element created by the collaboration of several characters. That's the that's three things that this you know make one different from the other. Um, and I could talk about that all night, but I'll leave it at that. Get the book, by the way, the rhythm method, razzmatazz, and memory. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, bro. So uh, one thing I noticed was in the poem that you said you published, like one of your first published poems, um, you lingered on one metaphor for quite a while. And as a newer poetry you read, you jumped from simile to simile, metaphor to metaphor. And you didn't linger on that. And I was just wondering if that was some evolution that came through your own readings or over time have you um, found it more interesting to use a lot rather than lingering on a little? Well, you get better at this, hopefully, as you go along. Early on, you just hope to create one memorable image. Then I wrote, on the map of your body, I marked a road. Oh, I thought I was the cat's meow when I wrote that shit. You know, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote that line, and I was like, oh, daddy. And, and uh, so I started the poem with it, and I ended the poem with it, <laughs> right? And... Also, you know, I tried to keep as much of that information streamlined and moving as, as possible. And, and, very and lots of successful poems do that. Um, as you get more sophisticated in your thinking, as you get more sophisticated as a maker, you try to, create, you try to 
bring in as many elements as you can. You try to, um, for me now, I try to make as many associations as I can because what I'm hoping is to show the, show the world in relief and to show how many associations there actually are between us. That, you know, this doesn't mean this. This means this and this and this and this. There are so many possibilities. And uh, Kafka said, art is the ax which breaks open the frozen sea within us. That every man has an imagination and that art is the portal to that imagination. And that and that, and also, every person can access that imagination through a variety of ways. I hope that my poems are somewhat like a uh, group of cans moving down behind a fast-moving car, and there's all the sparks that are coming off the road. You just hope to create enough sparks so that one of them catches in the reader's imagination, right? And if all of them catch at the same time, then that fire is going to be hard to put out. Uh, you mentioned earlier about, uh, you implied about the boredom of certain audiences that, uh, for poetry readings, and it, it, it just occurs to me that it's, a, it's a, also a question of delivery, and uh, I, I've found in many poetry readings that I've been to over the years that when you, when it gets too discursive, I mean, um, like prose, that you lose that quality that of uh, magic or whatever you want to call it. And years ago, I discovered this Mexican poet named Octavio Paz. And uh, he used the word sortilegio, which is enchantment or however you want to translate it. And uh, where you capture the, um, I don't know what you call it. Uh, you put the audience in a state of, I don't know what you call it. Can you, can you comment on that, or am I clear enough? <laughs> yeah, Lorca called it duende. Lorca called it duende. And what he hoped was, and what you try to do is, tonight there were times when this reading was going on where everybody was completely silent. That's what you, what you want to create in a poetry reading is as much silence as possible. Because within that silence, the tiniest filament then can light up and create a different experience for the person next to you or for the person next to you. Rock and roll's got to have chaos. Poetry needs silence. Dreaming in America is no cinch. Saul Bellow said that. And it takes expensive, it's expensive to find places to be silent, right? And to have places where you meditate. Lorca said that Duende was when death visited the artist as, and death was always present. No matter what's happening, death is present. And what Lorca meant by that was the constant risk or the constant ability to fail is what creates the, act, the dynamism of the performance. One of the things he talked about was there was all the, it was a flamenco competition. And there was all of these young girls and all of these fancy costumes and they had these fancy hats and these one girl after another came out with these wild flourishes and they were dancing all crazy and they were and one after another till the very end one woman she was very old she came out she had on a blue dress one blue uh, flower in her hair she stood in one place and she clapped and you tapped one foot and the rhythm was so dynamic and she was so present in her ability to transmit that single rhythm that everybody fell silent and the old woman won the competition. The ability that that woman showed to find the one beautiful enchanted moment to fasten the audience upon is what created that silence and that muscular dynamic took everybody in the room over and she was more memorable than all the fancy dancing that all the younger women had done. 
That's the Duende. I love Octavio Paz, by the way. He had a great poem called Sunstone. Uh, Sunstone. He's a Mexican Nobel Prize winner. That's who Mr. Crutchfield was talking about. Uh, Octavio Paz, P-A-Z. If you get a chance to read his poetry, it'll be a particular delight for you. Did I answer your question, Richard? <laughs> one more question. I'll take one more. Anybody? You've been a fantastic audience. You really have. Uh, like I said, there are books for sale over there. I don't think there's any limit whatsoever to how many you can purchase. And uh, I'll be happy to talk with any of you after when you get done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith, for being here. To the Literature Club. Um, on December 7th, our graduating seniors in creative writing will be reading here at uh, 3 p.m., 4 p.m., somewhere around there. You'll see flyers posted. Um, good luck finishing up the semester and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon.